Europe would have had easy access to, because Venice was the world capital of glass production in 1500. Leonardo's plan was to breathe through a long snorkel made from hollow bamboo. The drawing of it. Mm -hmm. Above the surface of the water emerges the mouth of a tube by which the diver draws breath, supported upon wineskins or pieces of cork. The lengths of bamboo are joined together with pigskin sheaths, but had Leonardo considered the effects of water pressure? As I inhale a little bit, which simulates the outside water pressure, watch what happens. Right, you see? so it just you're going to suffocate, yeah. or yeah, rather exactly. I'm going to suffocate. <laughs> yeah, well, not okay. me. The drawing shows that Leonardo understood enough about water pressure to place a spring inside the pigskin sheath to stop it collapsing. But could his grasp of physics in the 1500s really enable him to design an entire underwater breathing apparatus? Now when I inhale, go ahead and plug the side for me. Right, okay, so it's keeping it open. Exactly. And so, given the flexibility as exactly, well. Exactly, yeah. So it didn't fully collapse, which yeah. means that perhaps Leonardo had more interest and more knowledge in water pressure than we thought. Ready for the next test. Leonardo's diving suit is now ready. Jackie is testing it first in the safety of a swimming pool. Got here. A hollow cork float holds the bamboo snorkel out of the water. Also known as the mushroom. See how the water just runs right down. The water is shed away from the intake here, so there's no water going to run down inside. But a snorkel device such as this won't allow Jackie to go very deep before the water pressure makes breathing uncomfortable. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> that was completely amazing. I was really enjoying that. <laughs> it, was, it was good, but then when you get to a certain level, yeah. suddenly, it's really high, right? really struggling, and the pain in the chest is here. It's like, you know, it gets start to get really hard. Right. But, uh, you know, just a couple of inches, moving up a couple of inches makes all the difference and you can breathe really easily. Wow. It's fine. Leonardo's scribbled instructions for all his devices are chaotic and fragmentary. Perhaps they're also deliberately misleading. He may either have been protecting his intellectual copyright or trying to stop his designs from being misused. I have many times been asked to describe my methods of remaining underwater without sustenance, but I've always refused on account of the evil nature of man who could practice assassination at the bottom of the seas. Scott and Jackie are now going to test the diving suit in the Venetian lagoon, where Leonardo intended it to be used 500 years ago. We know the concept, as he sketched it, is limited and dangerous. So Scott has had to work out what Leonardo didn't tell us. The float, you know, the cork float. Yeah. It's way too complex for just being a cork float. There, there has to be something more to it. And as I was looking at the sketch, I started to realize that I think that he actually, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, actually put some stuff on the drawing that wasn't correct. I think he's trying to hide something else. And I'll tell you what I got. These holes up there, up on the top, up here, Yeah. the holes, I don't think they were up here. I think the holes were down low, because if they were down low like this, then we have a massive air chamber inside here now, and the diver still uses it as a snorkel. They can also grab hold of it, and he can pull it down. Eventually, you know, gas always goes to the uh, least amount of pressure, yeah. right? So it turns into a compressed air diving system. Right. Jackie now feels more confident and gets ready to take the plunge. Oh, that's it. Ah, it's very snug around the hips. <laughs> you lifted me right up, but that's so funny. Jesus. If Scott is right, this could make it possible for her to walk across the seabed. Lovely. 
So all I've got to do is get a hold of these ropes and then pull it down. I'm going to get this big load of fresh new air into the hood. And I was looking through some other pieces of paper here. He had this bellows right here, and there's a flexible hose coming off of it. So we're thinking that if we were to use the bellows, you're actually giving compressed air to a diver. Okay. So Jackie takes the plunge into the depths of the Venetian lagoon. But could she fulfill Leonardo's dream of walking along the seabed? diving suit is a triumph and Jackie is able to walk along the seabed just as Leonardo described. An underwater army. Men as agile as fish with armor adapted to underwater travel and with a constant supply of fresh air such as this. As a weapon of war it wouldn't have been wildly practical. But as an early diving suit, it is very impressive, particularly when you realize that no one else would get close to doing this until 300 years after Leonardo's death. Unfortunately for Leonardo, the suit was never built and his revolutionary plans were never tested. Attacked in another part of their empire, the Turkish fleet turned around and sailed away without a fight. And the Venetians sent Leonardo away without a single ducat for his pains. But Leonardo didn't give up. He went right on inventing. In his surviving notebooks, alongside the diving suit, are hundreds of eclectic ideas which seem to stand outside his time. Catapults, printing presses, spring-driven motors and windmills, artillery designs more 19th century than 15. His deadly-looking finned missiles look more like the high-explosive shells of modern times. And his notebooks also show another preoccupation, money. Alongside the incredible inventions and drawings are shopping lists, notes of the cost of food and clothes for his household detailing his permanent cash flow problems. His need to earn a living meant he often had to keep very strange company indeed. Leonardo frequently mentions his horror of war and man's inhumanity to man. But his ambition brought him in the winter of 1502 to the door of one of the most brutal and bloodthirsty tyrants ever known. At this time, the rulers of the various Italian states were engaged in a violent battle for power. But there was one man whose ruthlessness and brilliant military cunning they all feared. Cesare Borgia. Leonardo was very pragmatic. Leonardo wanted to be free to be Leonardo. And the only way he could do it was to have money. So he took commissions he didn't really want. Often he wouldn't finish them. He got involved 